We're um, going to um, look at, funny enough, another event that actually happened on Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday. Actually happened on what we class as Easter Sunday. The um, reason we're looking at it now, a week later, is because I'm sure you didn't want a three hour sermon last week, no? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Carol, you didn't have to shake your head so vehemently. <laughs> so, um, so, we're going to look at it again today. So, I just think there's a couple of things that we could just pick up from this. So, uh, if you're up for it, let's, uh, let's dive in, shall we? So, it's on Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Which, look, it's working again. That same day, two of Jesus' followers, so the same day is Easter, Sunday. Same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. So they walked along. They were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognising him. Recognising him, sorry. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? We'll stop there for a moment. So two companions, followers of Jesus, but not within the immediate closest seven of Jesus, uh, eleven, oh my life, <laughs> I did not have enough coffee this morning, uh, seven eleven, that's probably what's going through my head right now, do you remember the seven eleven? Yeah. That was one of our leading Broadway ones, anyway moving on, so um, not the closest eleven but clearly this is proof that not just on that day there was a, a wider group within Jesus' the followers, yes? On the same day. And this wider group clearly knew the 11. Because you'll get that. Because in verse 33, when they return back from Emmaus, they know where to find them. So there's clearly connections. And you see in a minute when they talk about the story of some witnessing, this, these two obviously heard this. They were obviously there when some of this came along. So just an interesting fact that we always focused on sort of the 11 uh, disciples, the 11 uh, apostles and such, but actually there, there was a wider bunch around of witnesses. I think that's a good thing for us to, to recall and remember. So anyway, they're going back home, we're assuming these two, to Emmaus. We reckon they're going back home, because when they reach Emmaus, as you may well know, they all, they all say eventually, what is Jesus? Come and join us for dinner. Yes? Well, you can't do that unless it's your own home. I'm not going to get into the debate, was it two men, was it a husband and wife, we're not going to get into that. But more for me this, was they had to walk seven miles. So today, in average, if you walk fast, that will take you 77 minutes. I've checked this out with Google, it's true. If you walk moderately, at a moderate pace, it will take you 105 minutes to do seven miles. Or if you take it really easy, it will take you 140 minutes, which is just over two hours. But that's if you've got tarmac roads. They didn't. So let's go with the fact it could have taken them, on average, 30 minutes per hour. So therefore then, it would have taken them how long? Three and a half hours. Thank you, Timmy. <coughs> Absolutely nothing relevant. Other than the fact, I think it's useful for us to note, it could have taken... Three and a half hours for them to walk from Jerusalem back home to Emmaus. That's a long time. And of course, as we know in a moment, as we know, Jesus appeared. So that's a long conversation. Now, we don't know quite where Jesus appeared in the journey. But, you know, they spent some time together. For me, it means that sometimes we have to spend quality length of time with people. Can't be all over in an instant 30 second car journey. So anyway, the two people are walking along and they're talking about everything that has happened. How do you think the conversation sort of went? It's where the imaginations have got kick in and that's a real question. How do you think the sort of conversation would have gone? Yeah, what now? I mean, the fact they're going home is almost a sense of, well, it's all over. Might as well go home. Anything else? It states in here that they were talking, um, they were talking about everything that had happened. 
So if this had happened to you, so you've, let's just, let's just say for a minute, they've known maybe about and following Jesus for maybe, let's say, a year and a half prior to his death and resurrection, okay? Let's just take a, an imaginative gamble at this point. What would you be discussing if you've been following Jesus for a year and a half, this, this teacher, and then it all seems to be over? What's the sort of things you'd be chatting about as you walk along? Is this it? I believe it. Sorry, when? Is this it? Is this it? Yeah. Can't believe this would happen. Can't believe this would happen, true? Um, there might be another conversation that might have gone like this. Oh, because some of his disciples, they were hiding. They were all saying, so, oh, where were you? Where were you hiding? Yeah. Did you hear what happened to Peter? So, yeah. Like that. yeah, that sort of conversation. Yeah. What, what happened said, to you? Yeah, Disappear. I know you, I know you. Yeah. So we might be talking about things like that. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Uh, for me, it would be who's going to take up the mantle, who's going to do what, you know, continue the struggle. I mean, he's, he has been teaching us for one year, preparing us for this. Are we ready to take up, you know? Could well have been. Challenge, yeah. yeah, who's going to be his next successor? Yeah. yeah? I was going to say the same thing. They could probably say, where is he always going to take over? Who's going to take over? Yeah. I think for me, I'll be looking back and where I'm going, like, but he did all that stuff as well. What happened? He did all those miracles. What happened? How did, that, how did this all come about? How did all of a sudden, one minute they're praising him, walking in, the next minute they turned against him? How did that happen? Politics. Yeah, politics of all that. Yeah, you'd be discussing that. You'd be like intently going on about it. So let's carry on. So verse 16, I do like this. But God kept them from recognising him. I do love this, that God stopped, reckon, God stopped them from recognising who Jesus was, walking along with them. I think sometimes we have to be taken on a journey without being fully aware that this is of the Lord. Sometimes we have to be taken on a journey of faith without recognising that the Lord, this is of the Lord as such. We're kept from seeing the whole and full picture while we're going through something. Yes? It's not until we sometimes look back at journey, we suddenly went, aha! <laughs> we can actually see that the Lord has actually been in on the journey with us. And so for me, the lesson in that is that the Lord is always with us, even if we can't spot him. The Lord is always with us, even if it doesn't feel like it. We do run our feelings somewhat, rather. Why were we created with emotions? Because we do run on them quite a lot. We seem to allow them to override truth. That the Lord is with us, no matter what. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you want me to turn down the heating? No, that's okay. I'm feeling warm. Under the collar yeah, rather hot under the collar, because <laughs> it is a bit tight. So anyway, um, but for me that's the biggest lesson. I love the fact that they just didn't recognise him. Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons why they didn't, but I just think for this today, yeah. for some people they need to hear that no matter how it feels or how it looks, the Lord is with you. Yeah. Now, verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? Now, I don't know about you, and it depends on what culture you come from, but if some random geezer comes up to you while you're deep in intent conversation and goes to you, what are you talking about so intently? What would your reaction be? Now, be honest, because different people from different cultures have different reactions, okay? So... Really? You, you come out that to me? Okay, that's cool. No, that's fine. Anybody else? <laughs> See, that that might be mine. That would be mine. What the God do you? What's it? I oh, know, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> would anybody go, oh, wow, thanks for asking. <laughs> oh, come on. Huh? I think it was different. Diff That's what I said about culture, because actually there's different cultures that more close today relate closely to biblical yeah. culture than, say, what we do here in, in the UK. 
That's what I was hoping from others, maybe, who might go, yeah, I'll, I'll quite happily start chatting to the bloke as we're walking along this three and a half mile journey to Emmaus. No? Steve, Steve Wood. You well, Steve Wood, this is just... The problem is Steve would try to evangelise the Lord Jesus Christ, wouldn't it? <laughs> depends on what's been talked about as well. So if it's something private, probably it wouldn't want to share. But if it's talking about something that just happened in the city that you're coming from, people would probably be quite eager to share. Like, have you not seen what, what happened? As what exactly yeah. happened in the story, which we'll come to. Yeah, this is true. Oh, look, and there he appears. Nothing, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, go back, mate, go back. <laughs> <laughs> like Brexit. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, it just seems to be the topic of conversation wherever you go. So, yeah, mine would be none of your business. I'm talking to my friend. Go away. I don't think at this point I would stop, as it says here, they stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. Sorry, the reason I'm laughing, I just think it's hilarious. <laughs> you must be the only person! No, you're right, I haven't heard, actually. I'm right in the middle of it. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I just... Oh. Random thought that went through my head. And then you've got Jesus going, what things? <coughs> now we laugh. Because we know what they're talking about. But, you know, sometimes we can misread things. Now Jesus didn't, he knew what he was doing, but he obviously wanted to unpack, well what? What is it that's going on in your head right now? Come on, I want to go on the journey with you. I want, want to listen to your thoughts out loud. And actually that's what our Lord is like sometimes with us. He actually wants to listen to our thoughts out loud. I heard people going, oh, well, God knows what I'm going through. I don't need to pray about it. You do, because praying is actually having a conversation with the Lord. The Lord knows what's going on in your head, but he wants to hear it from your own mouth. Because actually, as you start expressing something, you start hearing something back, <coughs> which is almost the Lord reflecting back your thoughts for you. See, these two people have got tied up in their own little, what they're thinking. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone and afterwards you've realised all we did was fuel each other's angsts. Yeah? yeah? Have I had that? Well, I just, just that, they just helped fuel what, how I was feeling rather than actually coming with a resolution. And I think here the Lord was deliberately challenging, so well, what thing? Let's open it up, come on. Have a third party involved. And the Lord's very good at doing that with us, saying, come on, talk it through with me. Normally that's because we then actually get to the end and we realise how daft we're thinking or feeling about something. And the Lord just allowed us to work that through with us. And this is what I think he wants to do. So, let's, uh, let's just finish this off. So what things? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. Just want to stop there, just a brief thing. Note that it is the leading priests and other religious leaders that they have de decided that G they crucified Jesus. We know the Romans did the crucifixion, but they clearly say we know it was our religious leaders that organised it. That's not being anti-Semite or anything of that nature. It's just, just a statement of fact that's being said here. But it's their religious leaders that organised it. We had hoped he was the Messiah who'd come to rescue Israel. This had happened three days ago. Then some of the women from our group of his followers were at his tomb earlier this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And that they'd seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out and sure enough his body was gone, just as the women had said. Now, just stop there for a minute. Just go through that with me from verse, verse 19. Look at the description they have of Jesus. Jesus, the man from Nazareth. 
Now, first and foremost, there was a lot more people called Jesus than just Jesus back then. It's a common name. It's actually still a common name today in various parts. So they're identifying Jesus the Nazarene, okay? So giving him some identification. But he was a man. And then here again, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles. He was a prophet. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God. It's an interesting description for Jesus. Total and utter underestimation of who he is. He's a man. True, but he's also God. He's a prophet. True, but he was also God. Mighty teacher. True, but he was also God. They completely underestimate him. They sort of almost downgrade who Jesus is in their descriptions. <coughs> Now, we've got to give our fellow believers their due, have we not? The man, as far as they're concerned, had been following him was dead. But we've just heard Cleopas give a full testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, haven't we then? <laughs> Given the full account witness of what's happened. But without actually acknowledging it's actually happened. All he said is, the women came back and gave a report. The men went there and discovered that his body was missing. But they didn't actually say, and we believed it. You see that at the end? I think it's quite fascinating that they really pulled him down. Now I need to point out to you, firstly they wouldn't have recognised the testimony of the women. Why? Women. Because they were women. Now I'm saying this is a man, so I'd better clarify this. Back then in their culture, women weren't to believed. Their testimonies weren't to be believed. Because also they could be fantastical in their storytelling. <coughs> I'd say these days it's the men. Anyway. <laughs> so they talk about the body missing and angels appearing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why the men had to go running off the sea. So they went off and saw and went, yes, body gone. Down to earth, body gone. That's it. No connection with anything else. Limiting Jesus. Limiting to, A, what he'd been teaching for ages... And then sort of just limiting him completely in who he is and the fact that he could possibly even be risen from the dead. So here is a question. Do we limit our Lord? Do we downsize him? Is the Lord large in your eyes or have you shrunk him down to your size? Let's carry on. Verse 26, uh, 25. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. There's an exclamation mark on that one, isn't there? Isn't it? There you go. That's subtle, isn't it? By the way, this is me command Jesus. We'll come to that in a minute. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Foolish people, uh, probably a better rendition is dull. You dull people. Dull, why? Because um, there's a sense for them that they've not made any connections. You've not sort of come to A plus B equals C. It's sort of more like A plus B, and oh, I don't know. Oh, I've not made the connection up yet. It's that sort of dullness, that it's staring in your face, yet you have not made the connection. Can you not see what is meant to be going on? Problem was that the, probably the disciples couldn't perceive the concept of a suffering oh, me, Messiah. Me. Uh, like Barry was saying, who's next in line? It's got to be a succession, it's got to be something victorious. They wanted a victorious Messiah, didn't they? As they said here... You know, we was hoping he was going to come and rescue Israel. Rescue not by spiritual means, but basically kick out the Romans. What they did not see in their idea of this, they wanted a victorious Messiah. They wanted one who they decided they wanted. And they hadn't noticed that actually Jesus identified with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Jesus identified his messiahship with needing to... Do you know there's too many S's in messiahship? With needing to suffer before gaining his glory. 
Jesus needed to suffer before he gained his glory. And the disciples didn't want that. They couldn't cope with that. So here is the problem for me. We reduce, can we reduce Jesus to our idea? We, we can reduce Jesus to our idea of what we want him to be. The kind of saviour that we want. And dare I say it, the kind of Lord that we want. When we do that, we miss two, about three million different things, but we're going to pick out three. He becomes a Lord who doesn't challenge our lives because we fit him into our lifestyle. He becomes my personal request machine and not the requesting Lord. And this is another one. When we reduce Jesus to fit our mould, <coughs> we miss out all that Jesus is able to do in and through us. The Lord works, walks in part. I really am not doing well with my language today. The Lord walks in partnership with us. Therefore, He actually does allow us to sort of reduce Him. He walks, walks and works in partnership with us. If He didn't do that, we'd be a waste of space sitting meeting in this room. But He actually wants to work in relationship with us. So He walk, walks and works, sort of. In line with what we want. So when we reduce him and shrink him and sort of curtail him as such in our lives. We reduce everything he can do. If we were willing to allow him to be all he is in our life. Then I believe our faith would increase. His activity would increase. His power, the resurrection power that rose him from the dead would increase increase because we're allowing it to flow joy of the Lord would increase think about it for a minute if we keep Lord out of certain areas of our life the joy of the Lord can't be in that bit of the life can it peace within us would increase doesn't mean all the rubbish that goes on outside of our lives wouldn't decrease but how we deal with it and how we view it as like I said earlier on, would recognise that the Lord is walking with us in everything. We have to become less so that he can become more. When Jesus said, take up your cross daily, wasn't a nice catchphrase just for us to go, oh thanks. <coughs> Actually, not there to make us feel good. It was there so that you become less, which does involve suffering, so that Jesus can become more. Jesus yielded to the cross. He suffered. He became less so that he could become more. And we are called to do the same. So how do we best avoid reducing Jesus down to our mould? Any ideas? It's really getting warm in here as far as I'm concerned at the moment. But anyway, how do we, um, how do we stop doing that? Thank you, Carol. That's the first one of mine. Well done. Reading the scriptures. Let's read that. Verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now that was a good journey. <coughs> Who would like a three and a half hour going through the scriptures with me? <laughs> Not today. Not today. <coughs> But he was going through the scriptures. And I just want to read the rest of the story real quick. But this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted if he was going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. 
As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognised him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Do you know I love that? As we were reading the scriptures, basically now, guys, as the scriptures were being unpacked, our hearts burned within us. Hope must have been fueled. They must have seen who this Jesus was in reality and started to understand who he is. And I'd say the same with us. Who's ever had it where you've read the scriptures and all of a sudden you feel your heart burning because God is really talking to you? Anybody? Right. All right, just me then. Fine. No, no, there's not much. But when we study the scriptures together at times, our hearts can burn because like a revelation as such comes upon us, yes? No, is it just me? You know, it took me five years to recognise that in my first five years of being a Christian. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis, there was more beyond that. But when we can read the scriptures, when it's unpacked for us, our hearts can be burning. For me, this was a perfect example of discipleship going on. Walking along together, studying God's word, unpacking what it means in our lives. This is perfect discipleship, isn't it? And if we're meant to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, there we go. Now, I'm not suggesting you go to Jerusalem or walk seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You can do that here. Yes? But actually, unpacking the scriptures... Meeting up with people, going through it, discipling each other, teaching each other, unpacking it together. Wow! Do I get a slight amen? Amen. Okay, maybe not. Shall I do what I did last week, mate? No, I'm joking. And so for me, this is amazing. So it's scripture that we should be doing. We shouldn't be living on a diet of occasional prayer and coming to church. We actually need daily digestion of the scriptures and discussion with fellow believers. Because we're to encourage and spur each other on, aren't we? And that's what it means why we shouldn't give up meeting together. When we do this, this will help us not reduce Jesus down to just a miracle maker, a prophet, or our version of the Lord. So when we read scripture, let's learn together. Let our hearts burn together as we decide each other. So, I make no abashment at this point. The turning is coming. The turning. Do you remember the great evangelistic thing we're doing in September called the turning? Yeah? Okay, I clearly need to keep giving notices about it every week now. Turn is cupping, and I want us to, I, I, we feel as a leadership team, it would be great if we become a really good discipling church. Yes? So I've got the discipleship books coming for the turning, which is ten lessons in learning how to follow Jesus and disciple somebody else. But it would be a good idea if we do it first, yeah? And learn from it. So the books are coming. So next week, start dishing them out. And you can start helping somebody else. So you've got to need to find somebody you want to help disciple within... Church membership, we have within the fellowship, yes? yes? I would highly recommend that if you're married or dating, don't do each other. Find somebody else. So if you're both Christians and you're married and you need to get them, go and find somebody else. Because you spend enough time talking to each other as it is, don't you? Or is it watching TV? You never know what the difference is. But find somebody else. So what do I want to learn from this? Let's not reduce our Lord Jesus Christ down to our size. Let him be Lord. And let us continue to learn from the scriptures. Let us read this and let us disciple each other. Just as Jesus discipled us. By the way, what I love the fact is, is the fact that it was so burning in their heart. So wanted to do everything, they then ran back the seven miles, the three and a half hours. It probably took them less long than three and a half miles. But they ran back late at night to finally let them go, You're not going to believe what we've just found out. <laughs> Let's be the same people, shall we? Amen. Amen.
We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.